You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Okay, welcome to episode 30 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and joining me today are two lovely ladies across the table from me, my regular co-host, Mindy Carney. Oh, hi. What? What was that? <laughs> you that you, you said you're going to introduce both <laughs> people. Okay, so I'll introduce the other one, which is Lynn Kleinmeyer, and Lynn is the newest addition to our team, so we're super excited to have her here today. She's going to um, share some stuff with us and just kind of join in and see what this podcasting thing's all about. Yeah, super excited. Yeah, so Lynn, for uh, people that maybe haven't met you before or found you on social media, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you were before you joined Grant Wood and what you did? Um, I would love to. So I taught seventh grade reading for 13 years in lovely Plattsmouth, Nebraska. And then the last several years, I was a teacher librarian at Titan Hill Intermediate, which is part of Lewis Central School District in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And so I served Titan Hill for two years and then actually added in Creft Primary, which is their K-1 building as well. So then I'm here. So you you worked with the great Josh Allen. I was saying, are I you like the um, head of the Josh Allen fan club? Uh, well, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. or the Hecklers Club. Yeah, you know, right. either That's one. Better. It's yeah. kind of one and the same. I really feel like. Uh, yeah. In fact, we were joking before that last year at iTech, he won the award for the leadership award, and he had the big poster, mm-hmm. yeah. which um, I took every opportunity to take pictures with, including oh, sure. um, taking it around and having other people take pictures with mm-hmm. it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, George Kuros and I uh, greatly admired his beard, which, oh, you know, well, who doesn't? Wiley you know? also really loves Josh we, Allen's beard. We've talked about this we before. Have I know. The beard. It, I know. It's a gold it's, standard for beards. It is. It's the standard by which all other beards are measured. That's so, true. Um, yeah, and... So Devin Schoening actually uh, commandeered that poster, and hmm. it found its way to my library. Oh, fun. And um, I took lots of opportunities to utilize it as much as I could. Like, uh, at Christmas time, it suddenly became Santa? a Santa or <laughs> yeah. for Josh's birthday. And it actually made the move. I was going to bring it, but I didn't know, you know if it would be slightly awkward to <laughs> have Josh joining us yeah. with a big head. No. Oh, well. Me. Maybe we should just move on. (laughs) (laughs) And so we got some uh, news and updates and things that have been happening since uh, the last time we were here. And uh, I'll start, since it's uh, top of the list here. But uh, we talked about iOS 11 coming out um, last time. And uh, it's out. So it came out on the 19th of September, which is Tuesday this week. Mm -hmm. And lots of new features. We kind of talked about those last week, so I'm not going to go over them again. But um, I thought I would do a little heads up for people if you haven't upgraded yet, just to let you know that some apps are not compatible with iOS 11 because they're moving to something called a 64-bit operating system. And uh, the old 32-bit apps will no longer work. So... There is a quick way you can check and see if you have any apps that don't work, and that's in the settings. If you go to General and then About and then Applications, it will show you a list of those apps that won't work. But uh, otherwise, you should be good to go, and uh, definitely do an up, do a backup first before you update. I think that's always good advice. Yeah, looks different, feels it different. Looks different, feels different. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. I, yeah. I see more of a difference on the iPad than the iPhone, but right. uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, it is good. I okay, but I so side note. How do I turn on my screen recording? Is that in settings? You know, Amber came to see me that about that very same thing. She did. Yeah, How it's do I do uh, it? under settings. Uh, you go to Control Center. Okay. And then you can customize the controls that appear in Control Center, which you oh. didn't used to be able to do last time. Right. So you can right. turn things okay. on and off. And screen recorder is not on by default, but uh, you can turn it on. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Aw, thank you. Hmm. All right, so um, next one up, Minecraft came out. Minecraft Education Edition came out with an Oregon Trail for the 21st century. So I don't, I haven't played this. I don't know much about it. I just know I saw it came out on Twitter and I got an email about it, uh, just that it existed. So I haven't heard about many Minecraft users out there, but if you're interested, let me know and be happy to check it out with you or see what it looks like. So I'm just kind of curious about this because. Yeah. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of teachers that are nostalgic for 
Oregon Trail, but how many kids are going to have heard of Oregon Trail? My um, kids have the well-cultured ones. I mean, come on. Like, oh. my children play Oregon Trail. Okay. We play the Oregon Trail card game. All right. And we ha- we have the card game. Super fun. We have we. Uh, oh. And actually, there's, um, and I can't remember exactly what it's called. I could look it up in a little bit, but it's an archive where you can go back and play the old school, oh. like the mm-hmm. pixelated yeah. Oregon Trail, which I have a sense of fondness sure. for. Sure. Because I remember, you know, taking out that floppy disk and putting it back in the computer. Yep. Yep. Hmm. All variations. Okay, I feel like a bad parent now because I don't think either of my kids would know what Oregon Trail was. I have... Well, my kids think it's fun because I always end up dying of a snake bite, which if you know me, you know how terrified I am of snakes. So they always think it's funny that I die of a snake bite. They don't have a lot of empathy, but they know the Oregon Trail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think in all my times playing, I think I've made it to Oregon once. Yeah, we've only done it twice. But it's kind of fun because with the card game, it's like a teamwork activity. Mm -hmm. Like you all join in kind of. Yeah, you can share resources. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up, I would like to share a podcast that I listened to recently. I listened to this uh, podcast from time to time called the Podcasters Roundtable. And uh, it's a group of podcasters that sit around talking about things or going going on in podcasting. And the last episode that I listened to was called Kids in Podcasting. And I thought I'd add it in here as a link for anyone that wanted to check it out because um, they interviewed a couple of kids, uh, kind of high school, middle school age, who have their own podcast that they just set up by themselves. Mm-hmm. One, one does one on ham radio, and one does one on book reviews. And uh, it just it was really good listening to those kids who are very eloquent and articulate and talking about their process and the things they do and why they enjoy podcasting. So. Mm. That's good. Worth a listen. Yeah. So next up, this was kind of a um, bummer this last week, but uh, Wiley and I found out that opinion podcasting, which Jonathan has always been a huge, I don't know, opinion podcast ambassador, if you will. Um, But unfortunately, opinion podcast is no longer hosting podcasts, which kind of made it a, a little bit unique to other voice recording apps. However, I mean, it still works and you can still um, host your podcast in other places like SoundCloud or Google Drive or something like that. But Opinion Podcast itself is no longer hosting. Yeah, you, so. can, you can record in the app and you can edit your audio in the app. But you, if you want to export it, you have to put it somewhere else to host it. Because they used to give you this nice website right. where you uploaded all your episodes for for free. Um, but I guess the hosting costs got the better of them. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I know those other options are easy to use. SoundCloud's easy to use. Google Drive's easy to use. So, but so if you're using that, just know. If you're using it, um, they are saying no more new accounts. Existing accounts can, can still, still use it. Use it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. We've also got a link on here to um, an Ed Surge article from Grant Wood's on Lisa Wilson. So Lisa's an administrator here at Grant Wood. I know we've been uh, talking when we had Beth on here about mm-hmm. the blended learning program we've got running here that uh, Mindy's attending this year with, right. with one of her school districts. So we thought we'd link to that. It's an article on EdSearch called Teamwork Makes a Dream Work. And if you would like to um, learn a little bit more about what we're doing or some of the results we've seen, because she talks about the data and the improvements mm-hmm. some right. of the schools have seen, I think it's it's a worthwhile article to take a look at. Yeah, I it was, I think, very... It made the process very transparent, I think, and talked a lot about the um, positives and some of the pitfalls that happened during those couple years when you're trying to figure things out. And I think it's really good for people to read about the struggles too of, I mean, even that an agency like this goes through when they're trying something new. So it's very well written. It's, It's a good article. Yep. All right. So this one, I don't know anything about. You're gonna have to talk about it. Really? Update to Osmo Words. Yeah, I didn't see this. Oh, oh what? Yeah. Tell so me the- about it. The Words app for Osmo got an update, and they've um, you've you've seen it before where it it plays in a, a more of a, like a hangman style game, yeah, where the kids just put things on the screen. So they they turned it into more of a an adventure type board game. You know, have you played the Osmo coding one? You know, mm-hmm. where he goes around on this path and he snakes around and goes right. to different things. Yep. Well, the Words app looks a bit more like that now, hmm. and you get to different points on the on the map. And you can challenge different Osmo people. So you could like be playing against Mo from the uh, from the drawing app, or against Obby from the coding app. Uh-huh. And uh, so, or you can do like a head to head with a, another person, 
Uh, it's like a two-player mode on mm. there too. Or you can have two people playing against one of the Osmo characters. Yeah. And as you go through, so the, you know, the words will get harder and there's more of a challenge in there too. So it's not just, here's a random word and the picture, what is it? You try to make more of a, mm. a game out of it. Mm. Little face left for Osmo. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. checked out the video last night and it looked pretty awesome. I'm yeah. excited to try it out. Yeah. Cool. Last but not least. Last but not least. SD um, proposals. Yeah. I thought we'd yeah. throw out there in case any of our yeah. listeners were interested in applying. Um, by the time you hear this podcast, you'll only have a few days. <laughs> Get on it. <laughs> but uh, they are due by September 29th. And uh, our team is going to ISTE this year in Chicago. Yeah. Next year in Next Chicago. Next year in Chicago. 2018. Yeah. Uh, so if you're interested in presenting at ISTE or you're in the Midwest and you're thinking about going, then definitely uh, take a look at that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Can't wait. So now on to our main course, Serve to You, Piping Hot. Lynn is here to talk to us about Flipgrid Fever. Flipgrid Fever is crazy right now. It People are is. like lighting up the world about Flipgrid. Because it's awesome. Yeah. So if I didn't know, what is Flipgrid? In a very succinct definition, it's a video reflection tool. Um, but it can be used for so, so much more. Um you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of any tool that really, truly helps make learning visible, um, that's going to engage students and really help them showcase their, their voice and anything that's going to build community. And so for me, Flipgrid is all of those things wrapped into one nice little package. So um, how, how does it work? Like, what do you... How do you make it work? How does this happen? The, how does the magic <laughs> how does happen? the magic happen? Right. Well, the magic starts with going to flipgrid.com um, and you have to set up an account as an educator, uh, which is very simple to do. There's a Google sign in, you know, just syncs nicely. Um, and then once you're in the account, there is a grid that you create, which is essentially think of it like your classroom. Um, and we'll talk a little bit m- more about Flipgrid one versus Flipgrid Classroom. Mm -hmm. But with Flipgrid 1, you get one classroom, in essence. Once you've created that, then you start thinking about your topics. And what are those questions that you want to ask your students? And so you create a topic. um, You then go through settings, and there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can set up um, your grid to have students be able to put in like their names and you do take a profile picture but you can have kids customize their profile pictures with emojis and stickers and annotations and things like that so you know that kind of the fun engaging piece of things um you can set it up so that as your students respond they can get um basically like little emojis back as a response from other people. There's a bunch of different settings that you can put together for your particular topic and it's topic by topic. Um, So you have that freedom and that flexibility to go back and forth however you would like to do that. Um, And then once you've created that topic, it's about collecting responses. Mm -hmm. So you can do it a couple different ways. There's a link that you are given that you can share directly with your participants or there is a code that they can use to join that particular topic. So, I mean, it's really pretty intuitive. Once you kind of start messing around, you can kind of look through different things um, in terms of those settings and how to share it out. But I think that's one of the things I like the most about Flipgrid in particular is just the ease of use for it. Yeah, so when I think about it, I think about, you know, ways that it helps, you know, encourage like student voice. And for those times in the classroom where, you know, kids have all got their hands up, but you can only pick on one kid at a time or another kid. But with something like this, they can all go on and they can all give opinions on things. Um, Some of those kids that are a little more reluctant to put their hands up in class are going to get, you know, a little platform for themselves and their own space and their own time. They don't have to be in front of other people talking about things like that. So um, maybe can you talk a little bit more about uh, why people would use it or give some examples? Well, I think um, the why, exactly what you just said, that idea that you can capture student thinking 
in a way that maybe isn't always visible in the regular classroom structure. And so giving those students voice um, processing time, that reflection piece of things is huge. Um, in terms of why people might want to use it, you know, once again, getting that reflection and making that thinking visible. Um, but one of the things I love the most about it is that community side of things that you can really truly build a collaborative culture within your classroom um, and actually even extending beyond. Because when students respond to the grid um, and to that topic, uh, their topics are then visible for everybody else. Now, within Flipgrid Classroom, you can then respond to other people's as well, mm -hmm. um, not just with that emoji little sticker, but yeah. um, also actually being able to type in and write other people's responses. Another thing that I really love is that you can highlight a student's response and actually use it to then launch a new topic hmm. where you can really truly have kids respond to a specific um, video that one of their classmates created, which is pretty powerful right. to really truly continue that conversation and spark that conversation well beyond that in-class discussion. So I think yeah. that's pretty huge. So if I remember rightly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, or I will just edit this part out, <laughs> um, you can create your own a video question for students to respond to but I believe you can also like add like a YouTube video or mm -hmm. something and have them you know make some kind of response or a connection to that one too is that right exactly um, you can put in a link you can put in a picture you can put in videos um, so that might be part of that discussion topic that you put in um, and put in those additional resources to support that student thinking right so cool yeah so um I think you talked about this a little bit, but how have you maybe uh, how have you seen this used at school or in the classroom at all? Um, a couple different ways. Uh, directly in class, I've seen teachers use this as once again that reflection tool, giving uh, students opportunity to respond to a specific topic, whether it be. Um, kind of highlighting their learning from the day or getting their thoughts and opinions as like a pre-reading strategy where you can show a video and kind of capture their thinking before. Um, but some of the things that I've seen that I think are kind of different and unique and once again kind of circle back to that building community side of things. Um, there was a school and I had seen this come across Twitter um, that had utilized Flipgrid for their staff and they created a topic and they had all of the staff members respond within videos talking about their favorite books. Mm -hmm. And then at the school's back to school night, they had the Flipgrid available for students and they could click on the different teachers' videos talking about their favorite mm -hmm. books. And so think about the power of that community that that just created and that culture of literacy mm -hmm. that it created. Um, and then in turn, having kids do the same thing, then take and utilize that for things like the book talks and the recommendations and building that collaborative culture. Um, and kind of going along that same vein, for me personally, one of my absolute favorite things that happened with Flipgrid was last year as a teacher librarian, um, through some connections that I had on Twitter with other fellow librarians, we decided to do a global book, sorry, go global book club. And uh, we chose the book Wonder. And so we linked in a couple of fifth grade students from the school that I was working at. My son's school, his sixth grade computer tech teacher, um, so he had a little book club, so the sixth graders in, in Nebraska, a group of high school students in Arkansas with my friend mm -hmm. Stoney Evans, who um, is a teacher librarian there. And then our friend, uh, Elizabeth, who is a uh, teacher librarian on the island of Guernsey. Really? In the English Channel. Yeah. And so we connected our students because of the time difference. We really struggled, especially me working in a second through fifth grade building, you know, trying to get kids there early when they're being bused in or brought in by parents. Um, we had done some things via Padlet to have kids respond, but we wanted that personal connection. And so we had the kids respond using Flipgrid. And so they were having that connection 
from halfway across the world mm-hmm. with students yeah. that they would have never had an opportunity to meet in real life. And so mm-hmm. um, that m- making things personal side of things, I think, is huge with Flipgrid. So those are just some of the things um, I've seen it done professionally. Um, I host a, a Twitter chat for librarians. And so we are actually using Flipgrid as a way to recommend books to each other. Yeah, cool. So even that professional side of things. So there's such a multitude of uses that you yeah. have. I was at a school last week and um, they used a similar video feedback tool that we might get to talk about in a minute here. Um, but you could absolutely do it with Flipgrid and um, the, the the teachers were on the technology team and they did a PD and they asked instead of having the teachers fill out a Google form to give feedback and suggestions on how it went and what to do next, they sent them a link to do this video response and so they were able to sit down later and see all the video responses from the from the teachers too. And I think that's sometimes, you know, when you see things in, in a form or in written text, it, it's sometimes hard to think about how they were saying that or why they were saying that. But when you actually see somebody on video, it's a little more expressive and you you know whether they're serious or not serious mm-hmm. or, or things like that too. So yeah, that personal, lots of good that personal connection is powerful. Yeah, and I think I saw just even on um, Flipgrid's, on their website somewhere, they have like ongoing flip like an ongoing flip grid going on so that people can just like share how they're using it Mm -hmm. there's like a ton of videos to watch it's just fun to see different people and um different personalities for sure and i think it's oh wow this is really interesting to be able to see how everybody's using them and just k through 12 like all kinds of people you know all kinds of students using it yeah you know i'm really interested um so pernille rip who does the global read aloud right I'm really interested to see kind of maybe how this is going to be leveraged this year with some of the global read aloud connections uh, that are happening. She actually put out a tweet not too long ago that she was having her students utilize it as well, just once again as a way to share their thoughts. Okay, well, since this is brought up, I'm going to ask the question that... (laughs) The burning question. The burning burning question question. is um, Flipgrid versus Recap. What's the difference? Or oh, I wish you guys could see the look on her face. She's okay. So full disclosure, I am not a Flipgrid uh, ambassador by any means. I just have a personal preference. Um, I think had you asked that question to me last year, I would have said that there was a major difference. Um, Recap, however, just in August announced a back to school release where they actually have updated quite a few of their features. And so um, one of the things I still think for Flipgrid, um, a feature that I maybe like a little bit more is the fact that you can embed the entire Flipgrid elsewhere. Versus in recap right now, from what I understand, you can still um, you can share videos, but it's not the entire group of responses. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a in recap, there's a highlight reel basically that you can push out to your students or whoever's using it. Um, So I think that is a definite advantage over utilizing recap at this point still. Yeah, and I saw that um, Flipgrid and Canvas have a new partnership. And if you want, you're able to put those f- grids into a, a Canvas course mm-hmm. as well. So if you're using the Canvas LMS, then that's something you could take a look at. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Recap did announce that they've got some some sort of links with Google Classroom. You know, but Flipgrid can too, putting in the link to the, the grid um, to that code t- for the topic you can still do that within Google Classroom. And so, you know, with those two tools, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do video reflection. And um, so since we mentioned our bearded friend before, Mm -hmm. you know, he constantly challenges me. And and so one of the things he had said was, why would I do this instead of just uploading videos to Google Classroom? And once again, I think it's, you know, with both of those reflection tools, I think one of the best things is the fact that as you're recording, the question is right there in front of you. And so you have that in the forefront of your mind instead of, you know, starting and going, oh, what was I so what was I supposed to be talking about again? Right. You know, I think it just helps with that um, 
<laughs> that focus for especially people like me who tend to ramble sometimes. Um, and I like the fact that with both Recap and Flipgrid, you can set time limits, which is also powerful Absolutely. in a couple different ways. Once again, if you've got a rambler like me, um, that might be a good thing. But then also, you know, helping to challenge maybe to fill in and and beef up their thoughts just a little bit or be very concise yeah so I mean there's I mean both ends of that spectrum but challenging those who maybe would have that one word answer to maybe go a little Mm -hmm. bit longer and maybe cutting down those people who need to stop talking so uh you talked about the paid version and the the free version how much is the paid version and what do you get that you don't get in the free version um with Flipgrid classroom um for a teacher account it's 65 dollars a year Um, and then there is, you can actually bundle a little bit. I think it's 10 accounts. Um, and I can't remember exactly the the price on that. I want to say it's right around 400, but, um, we can clarify that. But with the Flipgrid one versus the Flipgrid classroom, um, with Flipgrid classroom, you get the capability to have multiple grids. Mm-hmm. which there could be some power and benefit in that um, because currently you with the one grid potentially you could have somebody come in if the if you created accounts for your students for example they would have access to all the topics versus if you had a certain class that you only wanted access to this topic and not the others um so that would be one difference is the amount of different classrooms, in essence, that you could create. Yeah. And I think if you think about like elementary teachers, I mean, one classroom would be fine for them. They've got the same kids all day right. long. But if mm-hmm. you're a middle school teacher that does four sections you of math or something. 200 mm-hmm. kids a day. Yeah. And yeah. you don't want to have the kids in and out of every single discussion you're having. So, right. Yeah. And you do have the capability um, in, in either side, in Flipgrid 1 or Flipgrid Classroom, um, to freeze topics so that no one can no. continue to add to them, mm-hmm. which is nice. But, you know, if if that were a problem, you know, the potential of having multiple grids could be powerful, especially at maybe the upper levels. Sure. Can you assign certain students to certain grids? So, like, let's say there is a book club going on and you create a little grid just for five kids is with that a possibility the code, with the codes that you get yeah. yes in essence you can so the code isn't to join them to the class it's to join them to that actual grid to that actual yeah topic oh okay yeah. so you, could, so you can know send that. all right you can send specifically just to one topic Got and it. that's how i've used it used it before you know if i didn't want somebody going to my full list of mm-hmm. all the questions i've created right i just give them the code to that particular topic I think there's there's potential for it. And, you know, so with Flipgrid Classroom, there's a couple other features that you don't get with the free version. Um, things like the feedback that you can provide for students. Um, in Flipgrid Classroom, there's actually a rudimentary rubric that you can give them. Um, and some of it can be for those really hard to measure um things like the the speaking skills, there is a basically a speaking rubric, but then there's also um, your ideas and things like that. So you can provide feedback to students that way. Under Flipgrid 1, the only way you can provide feedback to students is if they put in their email for you to be able to respond. So just a slight difference with how you can push back and what kind of information you can po- push back. I mean, you can comment just, you know, nice job. Or you can give a little bit more with the Flipgrid Classroom. So that would be another thing. Um, Another thing that Flipgrid Classroom does actually have is the ability to um, differentiate on the times. With Flipgrid 1, you have two options. It's either, I believe, 15 seconds or a minute and a half. With Flipgrid Classroom, you have a much bigger range of time Mm -hmm. lengths that you can assign for students so those are just some of the the basic differences between the two cool so let's say i'm really interested in getting started with this lynn where would you suggest people go to kind of learn more learn more um they do have a great site uh info.flipgrid.com um 
They also have uh, very active Twitter accounts. Um, they actually have the account itself, Flipgrid, and then they also have a hashtag Flipgrid Fever, where people are constantly sharing things out. So both of those are excellent resources, depending on how you want to find your information. Great. We'll put all those in the show notes. On to my favorite part of the show is tech nuggets. Wiley, you're going first today. Okay, sounds good. I have uh, an app to share with you that I think thought was kind of interesting. I mean, it would have some educational applications, but otherwise it's just a really cool app if you want to see some of the latest stuff that's coming out as part of the new um, iOS updates for iPads and iPhones. There's a new uh, framework that Apple introduced called ARKit that helps developers uh, create these augmented reality apps a little bit better. So the one I'm uh, going to recommend you take a look at is called AR Measure Kit. And it does a number of different things. You only get one of these things for free, but um, it has um, measuring capabilities built in where you have this uh, like a on-screen uh, guide where you can uh, hold your phone or your iPad over the start of something and tap on the screen. And then you move it towards the end of that object and then you tap on the screen again and it measures it and tells you how long that distance is which I thought was kind of interesting I tried it on my iPad and went corner to corner on the screen and it came up with 9.7 inches so it must be pretty accurate uh, but there's other things available in an in-app purchase there's like a, a level you can use to you know if you're hanging a picture on the wall or something or doing your um, poster boards in your classroom you could uh, set this iPad up to make sure everything was straight and uh, even and that's probably something I would use there is the ability to measure how tall somebody is so in fourth grade, we always used to do this measuring uh, unit where um, we would get the yardsticks out and measure how tall everybody was and see um, what that data looked like and put it in a graph. But now you could do it with your iPad. So you just point the app at the floor uh, to get a, a ground point. And then you point at the top of the kid's head and you tap again. And it will give you an instant measurement of how tall people are. Also, there's uh, angles as well. So you uh, measure angles and things like that. You can... Um, Measure distances between fixed points and uh, visualize objects to see if there's uh, space to move things around. So, like, you could measure your teacher's desk and then uh, take a little virtual frame of that and put it in another part of the classroom and see, is it going to fit between the bookshelf and the window over there if I moved it? And it will tell you if it does or not. So it's called AR Measure Kit. It is free with in-app purchases. All right, so mine is not necessarily um, something new, but... I was thinking today, like it's not anything we've ever mentioned, and that's Google Keep. And uh, Amber on our team is a huge Google Keep user, and it's kind of getting got me using Google Keep because what's neat about it is I really like to do lists, and I really like to write them down um, and check them off. And with Google Keep, you can put all of that to do list right online for you and check them off as you go. Uh, there's some other cool things uh, involved with it. You can add pictures. You can add drawings. Um, there's also some geolocation involved with it. So if you have like a shopping list, when you walk into the grocery store, that shopping list will pop up and ding you to remind you that you need to pick up milk. Uh, I haven't really played with any of those things because I like to be incognito. I don't want anybody to know where I'm at. Um, but I've heard that that's something that happens. So I think Best Wants has that turned on. I don't. Uh, so if you haven't used Google Keep, it's right in your uh, app launcher. You just have to check it out in the 9 quilt, the Google 9 quilt, and uh, go in and just start a new one and see how it works for you. But I think you're really going to like it, especially if you're a to-doer. Okay, and oh, and I almost totally forgot about the neat collaboration feature to it. So you can add um, someone, just like with all of the great Google tools, is that you can add collaborators to your to-do list so you can share the work and um, have everyone see that visible to-do list. Where with a paper list, you know, that just sits on my desk and no one knows what's been checked off. So if you haven't been in to take a look at it, I definitely, you know, try it out and see if it works for you. Next. Okay, so um, my next tip on here is something I found uh, just purely by accident. I was listening to a podcast that I forget the name of. It's a podcast about design, and they were talking about designing for accessibility. 
And they said that if you dig into the settings app on Twitter, you go into settings and then accessibility, you can turn on um, additional options that make it a little bit easier for people with uh, disabilities or other impairments to access uh, things on Twitter. For example, um, you can turn on image descriptions so that when you add an image to something on Twitter, you somebody who is uh, visually impaired won't obviously be able to see that image but with a screen reader it just reads the text and goes straight past all the images but if you put an image description on there a screen reader will also read the description that you put on there for an image and I think that's a great thing that we should all start to think about doing Mm -hmm. you can do that in other places like in Google Sites and Weebly and Canvas and LMS things like that so just to add that alt image description Mm-hmm. Um, so there's settings like that in the Twitter app that I don't know. I just thought it'd be it was new to me, so it might be new to other people too. Yeah, yeah, it's completely new to me. Not heard that before. All right. Well, my last one maybe doesn't have a lot of educational value. However, I'll do some promotion for you that you and Amber just wrote this really fun blog post about using gifts in the classroom. Yes, we did. Right? Okay. So this last week, um, I was also. Um, investigating some AR stuff and thought about this little tool that I think it's been around for a a little bit, but maybe not something everybody have shown it. They're like, oh, I didn't know Snapchat could do that. So in Snapchat now, um, there's there's been a Bitmoji integration with Snapchat for a long time, but now your Bitmoji is interactive on your Snapchat. So you can put your little Bitmoji wherever you'd like it to go. And then there's um, different things that your Bitmoji does. So you can create these little GIFs of your Bitmoji, I don't know, like tap dancing dancing on the table, right? Uh, So kind of a fun way to think about um, if you're a book snapper or um, trying to find ways to engage kids, you know, using that Bitmoji in Snapchat is kind of a fun um, little nugget of of loveliness. It is fun. I I saw you dancing on the table this week. Well, you wouldn't (laughs) be the only one that can say that. You know what I mean? It's funny. I did. I danced a little bit on the um, Google Expeditions. Google Expeditions. Yeah. yeah. Sent that out on Twitter because uh, we're doing a Google Expeditions and VR session for Sunday of iTech. So it's just a little promo thing, right? Sounds like fun. Yeah. Sign up, people. Yes. Oh, we probably should talk about iTech. We didn't even talk about iTech. Well, our next episode is going right. to be recorded live at iTech, isn't it? Right, it is. So if you haven't if you um, haven't listened to any of our previous episodes about iTech, it's our ISTE affiliate conference here in Iowa. Um, the digital learning team from Grant Wood will be there. Buddy Berry will be there. Tony Vincent will be there. And uh, Dean Shresky will be there. Yes, and we're going to... Tammy Lind will be there. Donnie Piercy will Donnie be there. Donnie Piercy will be there. And we also have some great Iowa featured speakers, too, which are people from our area, um, local speakers. So definitely come and, and join us in the learning. Yeah, we're already lining up some great guests for the next episode, so uh, stay tuned for that one. Okay, so that's all we have time for this week. I'd like to thank Lynn for coming on and filling us in on some Flipgrid fever. Thank yes. you, Yes. Thank you. We'll have to have you back sometime soon. Love that. Great. (laughs) (laughs) What's going on with you today? I don't know. I don't know either. Why would you want to come back? Maybe not on a Friday afternoon next time. Maybe not. No. No. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you again for listening. Um, Feel free to leave us a review on iTunes or share this episode online with others on social media. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show, you can email us, podcast at gwaa.org. You can find Mindy on Twitter at Team Carney. Lynn is TH Librarian Zen. Library Zen. Super close. TH Library Zen. Uh huh. And I'm Jonathan Wiley. Um, so until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast. I just want to sit.
like in the corner and listen to you guys as you record these things. <laughs> Hours of entertainment. Mm. People mm. say that we're like brother and sister sometimes, just <laughs> bickering back and forward to each other. You know, yeah. as a new member of the yeah, team, Jane I'm, always is, would say that, like you two, like brothers. Yeah, it, it's interesting to watch the dynamics mm. of of team members, and and so yeah, it's, it's fantastic. 